bacteria. They exist wherever there is life. In the air we breathe, in water, and in earth, everywhere. Even within this root nodule, there will be found bacteria. Without them, we could not exist. Bacteria are similar biologically to higher forms of life, with the same ability to make use of nutrients, the same ability to grow and to perpetuate their species. Given suitable conditions, the faster growing bacteria may reproduce every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes they may double their numbers. 100 become 200. 1,000 become 2,000. 1 million become 2 million. The colony grows so fast because bacteria feed through their entire surface and because, compared to many other forms of life, the organization within the cell is simpler. We have gained much information about the internal structure of bacteria with the light microscope. The electron microscope gives much more information. From these observations, and from techniques of chemical analysis, a picture is being built up of the nature of the bacterial cell and its probable organization. In each cell, there is nuclear material. Here is stored all the information needed for growth and reproduction. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. This is the giant molecular structure which contains the genetic code, controlling heredity and predetermining the chemical reactions which will result in growth. Reactions taking place in the watery interior of the cell, the cytoplasm. Surrounding the cytoplasm is a fine membrane, playing a key part in the relationship between the interior of the bacterium and its environment. This membrane controls the intake of nutrients by allowing specific substances to enter the bacterium. It also controls the outward flow of waste products formed as the nutrients are consumed. There in the membrane are convolutions which increase its surface area. Some may join the nuclear material to the membrane at the points where the cell will eventually divide. Then surrounding the membrane is a permeable wall which keeps the organism intact and gives it its shape. Within the cell, growth and reproduction are dependent on chemical reactions controlled by the nuclear material. From the DNA, instructions are carried by strands of ribonucleic acid known as messenger RNA, to the ribosomes. It is there at the ribosomes that the nuclear instructions within the RNA are translated and the amino acids assembled in highly specific arrangements into proteins. Among these proteins are the enzymes which function as catalysts in the manifold reactions of metabolism in the cell. These chemical reactions require a constant supply of nutrients to provide materials and energy for growth and reproduction. In the molecules of nutrients, energy is stored in the bonds which link the atoms. It is some of this energy which will be utilized by a bacterium. First, Enzymes from bacteria break down the nutrients into successively smaller molecules. Small enough for admission into a bacterium. Inside the cell, some of the molecules will be further broken down by other enzymes. This secures a controlled release of energy which will be stored until required for the synthesis of new growth material. 
The basic means by which energy is stored and transferred is common to all forms of life. It is regulated by the molecules of the compound adenosine diphosphate, ADP for short. When a third phosphate group is added, the molecule becomes ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Energy is stored in the third phosphate bond. The energy stored in this bond may then be used to build new cell material. During the process, energy is transferred from the third bond and the molecule is turned back into ADP. Then more energy will be absorbed, reconverting the ADP back to ATP. This cycle within the living cell is a key factor in many of the chemical reactions essential for growth. Thousands of these reactions, going on unceasingly, together make up the continuous process of metabolism. The metabolism of bacteria is of the greatest significance to all life, to plants, to animals, and to man. Yet there are times when the presence and growth of bacteria is undesirable to man and he must endeavor to control them. For example, some bacteria cause decay, quickly spoiling food for human consumption through the secretion of enzymes and toxic byproducts of metabolism. The process can be slowed down by lowering the temperature, retarding the rate of metabolism and thus the rate at which bacteria reproduce by drying food, removing liquid water. The process is stopped immediately. Freezing food has the same effect. In all these cases, bacteria will still be present in the food, but their metabolism will be suspended. The addition of a preservative, such as vinegar, also creates an environment which will inhibit metabolism. Finally, sterilization with heat preserves food by killing bacteria. If one of these steps is not taken, bacterial growth will result in food spoilage. Another consequence of a failure to control bacteria can be the growth of dangerous organisms, the pathogenic bacteria. Toxic products of their metabolism cause diseases such as diphtheria and tetanus. To control pathogens, the simplest methods aim at removing all bacteria, harmful or not, either through washing or killing by heat. If these are not desirable, then disinfectants, such as hypochlorites, may be used. But they attack the skin as actively as they do bacteria. So, for the skin, milder antiseptics are used. And in the body, bacteria can be attacked by antibiotics, some causing bacteria to lyse and die. The most selective way for man to protect himself against pathogens is by immunization the method used in the control of diseases such as diphtheria and typhoid fever. But control presents problems. Some bacteria are capable of changing into a dormant state known as a spore. Metabolism ceases. The cell grows a tough, durable coat capable of surviving extremes of heat and cold and the action of most disinfectants. Now, methods are under investigation to force spore cells to germinate and thus become open to control. Another problem of control arises because some bacteria, when attacked by chemicals, develop resistance. And they may be able to pass genetic information to other bacteria. Thus, harmless bacteria may pass resistance to pathogens. 
Because of this remarkable adaptability, the search for new methods of control can never cease. When we think of bacteria, we think of disease, death and decay. But we should also think of life. In nature, bacteria are an essential factor in the whole cycle of life. Some are involved in the assimilation of plant nutrients from the soil. Others break down dead animal and vegetable matter to replenish the supply of nutrients vital to new growth. Knowingly or unknowingly, man has for long been using bacteria for his own benefit in making butter, margarine, yogurt and cheese. Now bacterial metabolism is being put to use on a large scale to produce enzymes, chemicals, antibiotics. Bacteria are used in the controlled disposal of sewage and active experiments are proceeding on the production of protein from methane by bacterial growth, a process which may in the future provide a totally new source of food. Whether it is in the activity of bacteria controlled by man or the part they play in the cycle of life, their significance relates to the way they absorb nutrients and to the byproducts of their metabolism. Our understanding of these processes grows with our knowledge of the structure of bacteria and of the way they convert nutrients into materials and energy for growth and reproduction. Bacteria which may be so insignificant individually, acquire enormous power in the mass. As our knowledge of bacteria increases, so does our understanding of the processes of life.